This is the cockpit of my little Cessna 172. It was getting on for midnight on the 15th of June, 2021. I was flying at 14,000 feet. I was roughly 2,000 feet above the terrain that was below me. But with many peaks as high as 13,000 feet in the area of the Montana Rockies, I didn't really have a lot of room for error. Now, my airspeed is equivalent to about 125 miles an hour or so, and it's pitch black outside. I have no visibility, essentially, outside the window. Nothing but the stars and the instrument panel ahead of me telling, us, telling me I was flying straight and level. When suddenly I noticed my airspeed was beginning to drop. What the hell is going on? I have no idea what's happening here. Now, 14,000 feet might sound like a lot, but in reality, it's actually a very little amount of time when you're so close to the mountains below you. Uh, essentially, I was, I was dropping. And here I was, 18 years old, flying over the, alone over the Rocky Mountains, fighting for my survival. It was a scary time. Instinctively, I grabbed the control columns. I switched the autopilot off and I go full throttle, trying to maintain the plane, trying to maintain control of the aircraft and stop the plane from stalling. Now, stalling occurs when the airflow over the wings comes to a stop or isn't going fast enough to maintain lift and maintain the aircraft in the air. So essentially, you're going from flying an aircraft, everything's happy flying an aircraft, to sitting in a lump of metal that's now falling out of the sky. So that's, that's exactly what I was trying to prevent. And unfortunately, things weren't going well. I was still struggling to maintain control. I couldn't keep my altitude anymore. And the altitude alarm sounded, saying, terrain ahead, terrain ahead. And I honestly had no idea how close I was to hitting the uh, terrain at that point. And I started to imagine, actually, I started to think what it would feel like to hit the, hit the mountain, strange in love. But eventually, I stuck to these three main principles that we're taught throughout our flight training. And that is to aviate, navigate, communicate. Now, what this is trying to teach us is that no matter what situation we get into as pilots, uh, no matter how, how strange and how unusual the situation is, we must always maintain control of the aircraft. And eventually steered my way out of the mountain wave. And two weeks later, I managed to gain my place in the history books as becoming the youngest person to fly solo around the world in a single engine aircraft. Now, when I completed my trip, the statistics were that uh, 574 people had traveled to space. And in comparison to that, 117 people had flown around the world in a single engine aircraft. And six of them, including myself, were teenagers. So it was a, a, pretty, a pretty amazing accomplishment to complete. But uh, apparently I'm the first other youth speaker here at TEDx Water Street. So uh, that's, I think that's also pretty cool as well. <laughs> but the UN defines uh, a youth as someone aged between 15 and 24. So you're probably thinking, what, uh, uh, you're probably thinking, why am I wearing this shirt? Well, according to the uh, fable philosopher Socrates, uh, he once said that man must fly high above the earth, uh, man must fly high above the earth, high above the atmosphere, and only then will he understand the true, uh, uh, understand the world in which he lives. And in my opinion, I think he was spot on. Little did I know that flying around the world would open my eyes to the vast beauty of the planet in which we live on. I felt amazed. It was amazing to become part of a community of pilots who had worked so hard to bring the world together. And it uh, was just an amazing feeling to know that I'd finished this accomplishment. But while flying around the world and while experiencing the sheer scale and beauty of this planet, I was thinking, and a lot of the time I'd find myself thinking, wow, this is an absolutely amazing experience. This is so beautiful. This is, this is incredible. And other times I find myself thinking, what am I doing? What, look what I'm doing to the planet. Look at what aviation is doing to the planet. And a lot of times I find myself riddled with guilt. And that's why I'm here. I'm here 
to talk about uh, uh, how people and how I can help, well, not how I, but how people are um, helping solve the problem of dirty flying. Now, I'll give some context here. So this is me actually flying over the, um, uh, uh, over the Pyrenees Mountains between Spain and France. But the aviation industry produces more than uh, 1 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide every year, CO2. And uh, that's a huge amount. Uh, that's actually one of the most polluting industries in the world. And to put that into perspective, uh, the Burj Khalifa, that's 1 billion tonnes is about 2,000 times the weight of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. So it's a huge amount of CO2 that's being produced. And you may have heard scientists say that the temperature is going to rise by two degrees by 2050. And that really sucks that flying is causing this. And let's imagine it was in this room, in this auditorium, it dropped to zero degrees Celsius. Now that's the point that water freezes. It'll be absolutely freezing in here. You'll all be sitting there with your, probably with your coats on. It'll be absolutely freezing cold. Now imagine that temperature rose to, just, rose to two degrees Celsius. It will still be absolutely freezing in here. You probably wouldn't notice. But that block of ice, that block of ice that was sitting here, would now be starting to melt. And that is what's happening to our polar ice caps right now. And the Amazon rainforest as well. Uh, that's being, def the deforestation in the Amazon rainforest is incredible right now. Incredibly huge amounts of uh, deforestation is happening right now. According to Brazil's National Institute of Space Research, uh, deforestation has risen 64% compared to last year. Over 363 square miles of forest was wiped out. And that's, up, and that's actually the largest amount ever recorded. It's about the size of Dallas uh, oh, in terms of trees was cut down. So it's just a huge amount. But that's where... Uh, uh, big companies and governments are uh, involved. They're, they throw out these words like uh, uh, carbon neutral, carbon tax, but these aren't words we want to hear. These are sort of marketing initiatives. These are ways of being able to produce, seem good while being able to produce CO2. These aren't, these aren't the things that we want to we see. Um, what we really want to hear are words like carbon free, zero emissions. These are the sort of words we want to hear. But of course, there are a huge amount of challenges that go with this. And that's what the global aviation sector is looking towards. Uh, all the best scientists uh, and engineers around the, around the world are looking towards uh, producing uh, um, and getting rid of this problem of the dirty flying. As strange as this may sound after what I've just said, humans need to keep flying. Yeah, we need to keep flying the way we are right now, but changes need to come about. Nobody has said, let's stop driving cars. I mean, I'm sure a few of you here drove, drove to work today in cars that run on gas. You know, maybe a few of you drove in electric cars if you did drive, but most of you definitely drove in drive um, uh, conventionally powered cars. And that's why we can't just stop aviation. I mean, it would cause huge amounts of problems. But the scientists are working, the scientists and engineers uh, are working towards it, and there's huge amounts of work going into it. Um, some of the work includes... Uh, uh, this. So this is a Savinian aircraft designed by Pipistrel Aviation and it actually became the first ever electric aircraft to be uh, certified last year. And uh, it's now being used with flight schools all around the world and private owners. And it's uh, an amazing aircraft. I actually flew in one after I came back from the Arnold trip, which was an amazing experience. But these aircraft, uh, uh, there's much more of these aircraft. So for example, uh, in Sweden, uh, Hart Aerospace um, is designing a 19-seat passenger aircraft, which is set to uh, be introduced into service in 2026. Uh, with And United Airlines has actually ordered 100 of these already, which is absolutely incredible. But as well as this, there's also a, a UK company called Zero Avia, and these are uh, these. This company is developing um, hydrogen aircraft, and actually what they're doing is developing a way to convert existing aircraft to run on hydrogen, which is, uh, I think, a pretty cool idea. But there's a problem with all, these with all these solutions. So hydrogen actually produces uh, almost the same amount uh, of CO2 as um, uh, the global aviation sector. 
Uh, but this isn't due to burning it, or this is due to the ma manufacture of hydrogen, as uh, the manufacture of hydrogen requires lots and lots of fossil fuels. And that 2% of that 98% is made up of green hydrogen, which is you know, emission-free, carbon-free, but the problem with it is that it's completely unsustainable and completely un, uh, uh, economical to, and impossible, to essentially, to fund and provide the av global aviation sector. So batteries. That's what, that's what we need. That's what uh, Pippa Strell is using, um, the Swedish company, batteries. But the problem with batteries is that they just don't have enough uh, energy density when compared to fuels or hydrogen. They're also heavy, they're uh, expensive to build, and they require a lot of, uh, of CO2 emissions in order to produce them. They need to be mined up, the resources. Um, so really, there's problems with batteries as well. But with that being said, batteries can be recycled, there's something like 90% recyclable or something like that. Um, and their capacity has increased a lot. Again, something like 90% in the last 10 years they've increased in capacity. So they're uh, uh, well, improving um, hugely and they're probably the most likely solution so far. But in the meantime, um, what's being, what's, what is the most likely, which isn't a perfect idea, is something known as uh, sustainable aviation fuel or SAF. Now, uh, uh, SAF is very similar to existing jet fuels, which is what you probably fly on, what I flew in when I uh, uh, flew around the world. And um, it's, uh, uh, what's great about it is that it can be used in existing uh, infrastructure at airports, existing airplanes with some minor modifications. And, it, uh, and all it does is run on, run on the same engines as it normally does. But it's made up of, uh, uh, it's a biofuel, so it's made up of things like uh, animal waste, animal pig uh, you know, fat, uh, uh, wood waste, things like that. So uh, there's lots of, lo lots of different things that can provide this. Um, and, ma and they claim, actually, that SAF produces up to 80% less carbon emissions than that of jet fuel. But again, this is fantastic, right? This, this just sounds, this sounds perfect. But of course, there's problems with this sol solution as well. SAF only produces, uh, last year, SAF only produced 0.1% of the global aviation demand for fuel supply. And so really, it's not, not nearly enough. As well as that, the production of SAF, as, as, as previously mentioned, it drops, it, it has about 80% less carbon emissions. But the production of SAF, again, outweighs the advantages due to uh, the amount of land that needs to be cleared, more deforestation, more, more uh, land needs to be used in order to make these plants and these uh, uh, crops that could be grown to be turned into sap. So really, it's a huge issue um, uh, in that regard as well. But the, uh, uh, there's clearly just no silver bullet yet. Humanity is still stuck in this sort of mountain wave which that I was caught in. Uh, we are all... Uh, we all need to find a solution. We're all in this turbulence that I was facing and dropping out of the sky. Now, there's just no silver bullet. But the best scientists, the best engineers in aviation are working towards this. And you're probably thinking to me, oh, I'm just, I'm just a dreamer. This, this isn't possible. This isn't a reality. But if you told me in 10 years' time that I'd be flying around the world in a single-engine aircraft, I would say, yeah, right. Yeah, that's, that's never going to happen. So 10 years from now, my pledge to you is that I want to have helped make the sustainable aviation just a bit more possible. Try and make aviation a bit more greener, uh, whether that be be involved in uh, flying electric aircraft, test pilot for electric aircraft, being an ambassador for electric brands or whatever. I just want to find a way to make uh, the world and our aviation, which is in my blood, which I enjoy, just better for the environment. And unfortunately, there weren't any uh, electric aircraft from my around the world flights. This was actually the aircraft I flew around the world in. Oh, right. And uh, uh, unfortunately, yeah, there was no electric aircraft. But if there was, I would 100% have flown around the world in one. But in 10 years' time, I want to have flown around the world in a fully electric aircraft. I want to, have come, I want to come up here again and say, uh, this is my journey, and this is the trip I made, and these are the changes I made. And I want to show the world that electric sustainable aviation is possible. So humanity is still caught in this turbulence. And as every day passes, we all get a tiny bit closer towards that mountain. But if we all work together and follow those three principles again to aviate, navigate, communicate,
we can clear that mountain and we can uh, save humanity. Thank you.